Does anybody remember what we're studying in here? Prayer. Prayer. Okay. That is what we're going to do today. What have we been studying? The armor of God. Okay, Linda remembers. All right. Well, Margaret, this is our, her, our last Sunday with Margaret, although she says she'll, she'll be back. She's not selling her house yet. She's going to make sure that, you know, Houston's the place to be. So uh, what have we been studying? So we're talking about spiritual warfare. You know, we are in a war, we are in a battle, and it's very real, and our enemy is very real. In um, verse 10 of Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And he goes on to say, For our enemy, or for this We don't struggle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. All right, do y'all remember what the armor is? What's that first one? You put on the belt of truth. Because in John 8, verse 44, it tells us Satan's the father of lies. I mean... Lying is his nature. Lying is his nature. And so how do you fight lies and deceit? You fight it with truth. Okay? So it's important that we know truth, that we actually be girded with truth. So what's next? Next we have the application of truth to our life. To live righteously. So we have the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness. And then we shod our feet with the preparation of the good news of peace. Because when we're in this war, it is easy to lose our peace. Lose our peace. But our peace comes from God. In fact, it's fruit of the Spirit. It's the third one mentioned in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. It's important that we have this peace. And then we have the shield, that shield of faith. We need to feed our faith. We need to feed our faith. That with this faith, with this shield, we extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. What was next? The helmet of salvation. Satan can't take that from us. He can tell us that we're not worthy. He can tell us we're damaged goods, that it's too late for us, we've gone too far, etc., etc. All lies. We have the helmet of salvation. Last week we talked about the sword. We learned yesterday it's more like a dagger. It's a small sword or a big knife of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it is specifically the spoken Word of God. We talked a lot about that last week. If you weren't here last week, if you didn't uh, catch the lesson last week, I encourage you to go back and watch that one. If you don't watch any others, watch the one from last week. It's important that we understand that dagger and we know how to use it. We, we refer back to Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus did that very thing. Where he was being tempted by Satan and he's, he's told Satan, for it is written. And he quoted scripture. All three times he was tempted. Okay, so that concluded, through verse 17, concluded the the six pieces of armor that are listed. But part of spiritual warfare is uh, prayer. So in, uh, helps if you turn this on, let's read verses 18 through 20, Ephesians 6. 
It says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, so first thing here, prayer is vital to the Christian. It helps us put on our armor. So where where is spiritual warfare fought in the spiritual realm? And to a large extent, it comes down to a competition, if you will, for what our mind is going to dwell on. Okay, we've talked a lot about Philippians 4, 8. There's eight things listed. Let your mind dwell on these things. Okay, do you struggle with that or not? What does your mind dwell on? Where, where, what is this, where are your affections and your desires? Well, prayer helps us to focus on the right thing. Helps us to dwell on God, dwell on his truth. That's that belt. Helps us apply that truth to our lives. Gives us peace. And to pray the word of God. (coughs) Remember, (coughs) when we speak the word of God, that's the sword. Okay. Prayer is not like a national anthem before a game. You know, you have the national anthem. doesn't really have anything to do with the game, it's just something you do beforehand, right? Well, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is to be it's woven through the game, if you will, through our lives, through what we do, through everything that we do. So it's not like a national anthem. It's also not the spare tire. What's the spare tire? Well, it's there in case of emergency. Otherwise, it's back there somewhere. A lot of times we use it like that, don't we? Our our prayer life, how's your prayer life going? Well, I'll pray when I really need something. Otherwise, uh, it's it's back there somewhere. It's not meant to be that way. Okay? All right, so my observation, this, this is Joe Brown commentary, but I feel pretty good with it, is that a healthy prayer life equals really that you're doing well spiritually. Growing spiritually. And the opposite is also true. In other words, our prayer life is kind of a barometer. This is where we look in the mirror and say, well, how are we doing? How's my prayer life? Okay. Comments, questions on that? Anybody want to talk about their spouse or anything, you know? (laughs) All right. Now, it says in verse 18, with all... Prayer and petitions, Ephesians 6, 18. With all prayer and petition. Prayer is kind of an overall general word about prayer. There in petition or supplication is asking God for something. You can either be asking on behalf of yourself or on behalf of others. And we'll talk about that. All right. God can intervene for us on many things. But, you know, he may not do it unless we ask for it. This may not be something we uh, appreciate because it's easy to think, well, God knows what's best for me, for my children, for my family, for you know, fill in the blank. Therefore, he would do that if he wants to do that. But there's this principle about asking. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it's a verse that you know. It says, ask, and it'll be given to you. Yeah, seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened. Yeah. Yeah. So, he tells us, ask, and it'll be given. In uh, James chapter 4, in verse 2, that's up there in the yeah. It says, very interesting verse. It says, you do not have, and it tells us why. Why do you you not have? Because you didn't ask. Interesting. 
Interesting. You don't have because you didn't ask. I know I, I don't think I err on that one a lot. I, I do a lot of asking. Hopefully for the right things, more than anything, for the spiritual well-being of my family. I pray for that more than anything. But the very next verse in James chapter 4 and verse 3, it says you, you ask and you don't receive. And it tells us why. It says because you ask with the wrong motives, you get the wrong heart that you may spend it on your pleasures. Okay, Lord, I would like a nice red Corvette. You know, that's, eh, that's not the prayer. Okay? But this thing about prayer, this concept of asking. I've heard, I've, I've read, I read a book, it had this illustration in it of you get to heaven and I think it was Peter, I don't know, whoever, but it went to this warehouse. And everybody had this, in this warehouse, everybody had a box. So you go down this row, okay, you, know, you find your box. It's got your name on it. What, what is in my box? Well, it's all the things that the Lord wanted to bless you with, but you never asked for it. Therefore, he didn't give it to you. Okay? So don't be afraid to ask. But ask with the right motives, the right heart. Okay? Um, how many of us spend more time talking to others about our problems than we talk to God about it? Hmm. That's something to think about. You know, we may spend a lot of times, woe is me, <laughs> talking to our friends. We need to engage the spiritual realm if we want, if we want God's involvement in this. So seek, seek Him. Pray the word of God. You know, we could talk a lot about that. We, we won't this morning. If you go look at the Psalms, and I was doing that this morning, because I later on I have the privilege of leading our prayer in our worship times. So I was trying to figure out what am I, what am I going to pray about. A lot of the Psalms are prayers, Okay. Pray the word of God. Here, here I have, for example, the 51st Psalm. Are you struggling with sin? And which of us don't at times? Uh, the 51st Psalm is a prayer. Well, actually, 51st Psalm is a psalm that David wrote regarding his sin with Bathsheba. I particularly like verse 10. Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I pray that a lot. All right, it says to pray at all times. Uh, Greek words here, chronos is time in general. Kairos is the word used here. Uh, it's a season or specific time, all opportune times. When should you pray? Pray when you're thankful. Pray when you're tempted. Pray when you're burdened. All situations of life. Again, when, when do... When do people often pray when they don't pray at other times? They often pray in times of need, right? Otherwise, it's that spare tire. It's back there somewhere in case of an emergency, which is not how prayer is supposed to be. Um, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2 says, Be devoted to prayer. Keep alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Okay. Um, we're going to come back to that scripture here in a little bit. First Thessalonians 4.17, pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Does that mean you need to be uttering a prayer 24-7, 365? It should be, yes, sir. What did I put? 4.17, 5.17. Thank you. All right. No, thanks for that. First Thessalonians 5.17. What, John? Ephesians 6, verse 18. That's where we picked up. That's about prayer. All right. What about pray, pray without ceasing? It, it's just be part of our DNA. It's how we roll. It's what we do. Shouldn't even really be something we have to think about. It's just what we do. 
We talk to God all the time. We're walking down the hall, driving, whatever it is we're doing. What was that, Gene? Yeah, driving especially, okay. It's a mindset, okay. A heart posture, okay. Anybody else? All right, more scriptures regarding prayer. This, this is not a, an exhaustive list of scriptures by any means. In Acts chapter 1, here uh, the apostles were told to, to, to go wait in Jerusalem. And they're in this upper room. Uh, you're down to 11 apostles at this point. Judas Iscariot is, is dead. And uh, they are in this upper room and they, they are spending time in prayer. Skip forward in chapter 10 of Acts. You, it talks about Cornelius. It tells us that he was a devout man. He was a Roman centurion. It says that he spent a lot of time. He prayed to God continually in Acts chapter 10 and verse 2. In chapter 12 is an interesting story. Here it starts off we have James, the brother. Remember he had James and John Sons of Thunder, Sons of Zebedee, okay, Apostles. And James is killed with a sword, okay. Herod was not a, not a friend of the, of the Christians, of the Apostles. They had him killed with a sword. The people liked it. So Herod has Peter arrested and he's going to do bad things to Peter. An angel comes and rescues Peter from prison. Peter thinks he's seen, just seeing a vision, but this angel tells him, get up, put your sandals on, put your cloak around you, and let's go. And they walk out. They go past the guards, and then the last gate, the gate opens by itself, and then the angel's gone. Peter, it says, my translation says, comes to himself, because he thought he was in a vision. But he goes, so... It tells us earlier in that chapter, where we got in verse 5, that the church had been praying fervently for Peter. Okay, so James had just been killed by a sword. Now they've arrested Peter, and they're, they're really fearful for what's going to happen to Peter. The church is fervently praying. There's a lesson here. I don't know for sure that it was the same people, but now Peter comes up to a house. If I remember right, it's the house of uh, the mother of Mark. And uh, knocks on the door. And this girl named Rhoda answers it. She recognizes this Peter's voice. And she's like, it's Peter. But she doesn't open the door. She goes back and she tells the people who've been praying for Peter's release, Peter's at the door. Now, what is their attitude about that? Rhoda, you're a, you're a knucklehead, okay? <laughs> if somebody's there, you can tell me exactly what they said, but they're like, you're out of, no, it's Peter's angel, they say, okay? So, to me, I find it interesting. Huh? Was Peter a member? Peter was a member of the church. He was one of the apostles. And um, but they were praying specifically for something. It was answered <clears throat> and they're shocked. They weren't believing it. Hey, there's a lesson there for us. Okay? Let's pray with faith. Oh, we'll go back. Uh, Philippians 4 6, you know, verse that we've talked about a lot, and Chris taught before I did, specifically talked them. But what does it say? It says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer. Supplication with thanksgiving. So what's the recipe for not being anxious? Lay it before God. Lay it before God. All right. It says to pray in the Spirit. Much of my life I've wondered, wow, what exactly does that mean? In Ephesians 6, 18, it says to pray in the Spirit. Is it big S or is it little S? Well, the original language doesn't have capitalization. Um, 
In other words, is it, is it that spirit in us or is it God's spirit? Was it, I don't know that it makes a lot of difference here in terms of what this means. Although in the 20th verse of Jude, it specifically tells them praying in the Holy Spirit. So, it's big S in Jude. I tend to think it is here too. But what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Because we're commanded to do so. Therefore, it's something we want to do. Well, here's Joe's put on, on what it means to pray in the Spirit. It's the opposite of in the flesh. In Romans chapter 8, it talks a lot about this in the first half. It's just a contrast between our minds set on things of the flesh versus things of the Spirit. Okay? It's our, what, what is our attitude? What's our heart set on? Our heart and mind need to be in submission to God. They need to be tuned to Him. On uh, Romans eight thirteen, it says, um, if you're living by the flesh, you must die. Okay? But if you are, uh, if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. And those who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We need to be led by the Spirit. Allow God, allow the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and convict your heart as you pray. Hopefully this is not a foreign concept to you. We should be in tune with God, His way, submitting to Him, as opposed to thinking about other stuff. Your cowboys are playing at noon today. Are you thinking about that? That ain't, that ain't in the Spirit, Okay. Comments, questions here? I don't know that I have all the answers to what praying in the Spirit is. Anybody? The Holy Spirit is an advocate for us. Okay, Holy Spirit is an advocate. It tells us that in, uh, in Romans 8, verse 26, I think. Um, that he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Uh -huh. We don't know how to pray. He intercedes for us. Okay. Okay. So he does that. But I still come back to, gee, what does it mean, Joe, to pray in the Spirit? My spirit needs, to, my, my little S of spirit needs to be engaged. Okay. Okay. Another, another in the spirit. Spirit must be engaged. Just said that we must engage the spirit to marshal, marshal spiritual forces to come to our aid. Here, the context still this spiritual war that we see. Yes, Chris. Okay. So there were those who could pray in the Spirit and may be very effective for those in the congregation if this is a public prayer, but that's not <clears> the discussion <throat> in Ephesians 6, maybe 1 Corinthians 14. But I'd be thinking of, rather than getting information <clears throat> prayer, where is my heart? Okay. Okay, so for those uh, online, I'll see if I can give the Reader's Digest there. Um, Chris is making a point, didn't think this means that an inspired prayer, and in case there's any confusion here, uh, nor do I, okay, that uh, this is being in tune uh, with God's Spirit, okay, because He obviously speaks to us 
in his word. Okay? I think I would still say as you're, as you're praying, be guided by his word. Be guided by, let God guide you, lead you, give you wisdom. Be right before him. Instead of, you know, is it, is it easy or hard to be in the flesh and think about things of the flesh? Very easy. What about while we're praying? Is, is it still easy? It's still easy. It's easy to let your mind go other places. I wonder, were they really praying for Peter's release? Okay. I wonder if their prayer might have been for Peter to show courage when he is executed. Okay. Okay. The comment was made back back in Acts chapter 10, wasn't it? That uh, 12, 12, where they, uh, yeah, 10 is Cornelius. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, were they really praying for Peter's release or were they praying for Peter to have courage when he's killed? It's a good, it's a good question. I'm, I'm thinking they're praying for his, that he's going to make it, but that's, that's supposition on my part. Half and half, Rick. Okay. Okay. All right. Strengthening of faith, okay. In in in. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. So a heart must be engaged, not just mouthing words. You ever heard anybody that just prays the exact same words every single prayer they ever pray? You know, we're not the judge, but that that's not what we want to do. We don't need our prayer to be rote. Routine. That is not praying in the spirit. Uh, quote scripture. Put a spiritual truth situation in your prayer. It goes back to lesson last week about uh, speaking the word of God. Um, think about when you struggle with something. Go look at the Psalms. And I encourage you to pray the Psalms. Whichever one applies to whatever it is you're struggling with. Um, Put here similar in John chapter 4 and verse 24 talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth. I also wonder, okay, what exactly does that mean? Because I want to make sure I do it. I understand what truth is. How do I worship in spirit? I think it's to have our spirit engaged. Is it easy to sit out here in the pew and go sing, blah, blah, blah? Okay, what did I just sing? I don't know. My mind was somewhere else. That's not worshiping in spirit. All right, then it tells us in uh, the latter part of verse 18 of Ephesians 6, to be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Of course, saints are fellow Christians. Remember, this is war. 1 Peter 5, 8, what does it say? This is the one that says, your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Who do lions devour? The one that gets off from the herd. The one that's weak. The one that's sick. Maybe the young. They don't have any pity, any mercy. Be on the alert. For who? Not just for yourself. For all of our brethren. Pray for them. Do you do that? Do you do that? Don't get lulled to sleep. Okay, a soldier... A soldier entering battle, remember in battle, does, doesn't just look out for himself, but he also looks out for his fellow soldiers. Then I got James 5.16 here. It's just a, <clears throat> a passage which talks about prayer. It actually says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another. Do we do that? Yeah? yeah? Okay. I'm going to say most people do not. That's my dirty laundry. And if I tell you about it, I'm, I'm afraid you're just going to go blab it to other people. Now, we shouldn't think that way. But what does it say? Confess your sins to one another. It, it happens from time to time. And some people maybe are better with this than others. But I'm going to say generally speaking, we do not do this.
So, but, so, so yeah. Okay. Okay, you confess your shortcomings. Plus, you know, somebody else's sin is bigger than my sin, right? Yeah, okay. Sin, sin. You know, and this is it was this a suggestion in James five sixteen? It's a command. Confess your sins to one another. Now what I think I think the practical thing here is we need to have a group of fellow Christians, it can be a small group, that, that we have close enough relationship with, it's a safe place for us. We can do this. And then what do they do? Pray. You know, for healing, what kind of healing here? Well, I don't know. Well, I'm sure it's not limited to physical. And I suspect it's em- the emphasis is spiritual. But it's healing how many need to be healed? How many have wounds? This is another thing of prayer. Okay, it says the effective prayer, and specifically the word used there is supplication. Asking something of God. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. At least that's what it says in the New American Standard. It says effective. The Greek word used there is energio. It's where we get the word Energy. Uh, it means active, engaged. This is, this is, imagine it's not just a blah, blah, you know, every once in a while. It's, it's, it's active. It's an active prayer life, praying for each other. Prayer is powerful. It marches spiritual forces of God to act on our behalf, as well as on the behalf of others. Okay, this is kind of a summary of what we've said so far. We need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray according to the will of God. Okay? We need to have James chapter 4 and verse 3. We need to pray with the right motives, the right heart, the right attitude. In the 15th chapter of John, the context here is the uh, vine and the branches, where chapter 15 starts. He says, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You can't do anything without me, Jesus tells us. Abide in me. Abide in me. Verse 7, it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Earlier in James, in chapter 1, here the context is, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, and who doesn't? Let him ask of God, who gives to all men. But there's a caveat. It says, You must ask in faith, without doubting. Do you know that? From time to time, I hear some very timid prayers. It's almost like, Lord, I'm going to ask this. I know you're not going to do it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You have to ask in faith. It goes on to say, he who, he who doubts, it's like the surf of the sea, tossed here and there. It goes on to say, let not that man expect he'll receive anything. That shield, that faith. We must ask in faith. It reminds me of Jesus when he was in the garden. He told his disciples to stay awake and pray. Okay. Okay. He said the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Because he knew that Satan was going to come into their midst and scatter them. Their faith was going to be tested. Okay. Jim's talking about uh, in the garden of Gethsemane when Jesus told them, stay awake, pray, that your faith will be strong. Okay. Okay, all right. All right, these passages we've got here, 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, we'll read those. It's on the screen, 1 John 3, 21 and 22. It says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us. We've got an if-then statement here. The if is if our heart, where's our heart? Is it in the right place? Are we right before God? If our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God in whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Hmm. 
sounds to me like some of the blessings that we may or may not receive depends on where our heart is before God. And if you read that differently, let me know. But Okay, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Well, interesting thing here, we, we've probably heard it a lot. If we ask anything according to his will. All right. So what about answer to prayer? Have you ever prayed for someone who's terminally ill to be healed and they weren't? They died. We probably, we've, probably we've all experienced that. Where was God? Did he not care? Have you ever been disappointed by the answer? Or it seemed like you just didn't get an answer? Or for me personally, the answer may come, but it doesn't come. I mean, I don't want an answer a year. I want an answer right now. <laughs> Patience is not one of my strengths. Oh, God's will is not always going to be what we expect. You mean I don't necessarily know what's the best for me, Jim, or the best for you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're children, right? And those that have had children can identify with the child may ask for something that is not in their best interest. We must remember we don't always know what's best for us. God certainly does. You know, we're physical beings, and... We get wrapped up in the physical world. Our affections, our desires are often wrapped around. And by physical things, I mean, it may be our physical health, the physical health of our loved ones, the physical stuff, things that go on in the physical realm. God cares about us, but he's certainly not wrapped up in physical things. God's wrapped up in spiritual things, spiritual Things of spiritual import, things of eternal consequence, things of heaven. Okay, we need to remember that. Not that he doesn't care about our physical well-being. Some things are God are just beyond our comprehension. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, yeah, I can't quote it. Um, let's just go to it. Uh, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes I have to remind myself of that. Sometimes the Lord <laughs> reminds me of that. Bad things happen to a lot of people in the New Testament. Remember Stephen? What happened to him? He got stoned. I, I've never been stoned, and quite frankly, I'm not, I'm not planning to ever get stoned. It's probably a painful way to go. Paul's thorn in the flesh, whatever that was. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we could read about all the things that happened to Paul. Okay? Being, being beaten. The number of times he was beaten. He was stoned and left for dead. He wasn't dead. But it was so bad I think they thought he was dead. A lot of things happened to shipwreck, hunger. If you want to read about it, there's a whole list there. We've already talked about where James, the brother of John, was killed by a sword. John the Baptist was beheaded. Early Christians suffered a lot of stuff. The Revelation talks a lot about persecution and the martyrs and um, a lot of things that went on back during that time uh, in the first century of Christians being persecuted into the Roman Empire. Okay, so because you're a Christian, by no means makes you immune to suffering in this world. So don't think that, well, if I just ask for protection from any suffering, that God will provide it. He may, but certainly uh, likely that he won't. Huh? 
Well, okay, now you're going back to the armor, which we're talking spiritual stuff. The spiritual battle, put on that belt of truth, that breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the preparation of the good news of peace, the shield, the helmet of salvation, and the sword or dagger of the Spirit, which is the spoken word of God. These are all things to fight the devil. So it's okay to pray about physical things. Absolutely. We've already talked about Philippians 4, 6. Don't be anxious for anything. That includes physical things. But do what? Lay to God's feet. Okay? And the God uh, of peace will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. But we need to be mindful of spiritual things as well. A lot of times, if you look at our prayer list, which I haven't looked at our prayer list in our bulletin this morning, but it is most likely physical stuff. Okay? Now, one reason that is, because we don't typically share, I mean, I can share, well, pray for me, pray for my whatever, pray for my child, because they've they got some physical problems, some ailments, some hospitalization. We don't say, we don't typically share, pray for me because I'm struggling spiritually. Pray for my loved one because maybe that's why our prayer list doesn't have that on there. But we need to be mindful of spiritual things. Okay? Almost all the examples, things that Paul says that he prays for. He's got an awesome, awesome prayer in Ephesians <clears throat> in chapter 1 and in chapter 3. And they are very spiritual in nature. All right. <clears throat> this is just a list that I made of things um, to pray for that are of a spiritual nature. When I pray later this morning, if you pay attention, you'll see I'm going to go right down this list. Okay? We need to pray for our faith to be strengthened. That's already mentioned. Jim mentioned that this morning. For forgiveness. And for a penitent heart, and to have a forgiving heart. Anybody ever wronged you? I can't relate to you if nobody's ever wronged you. Okay? Anybody ever been just downright nasty to you? And there's a decent chance there it, it happened in the church. Okay? That's where I've received most of my pain in my life, is from the place that it really shouldn't be happening. But what about forgiving that individual? Is it hard or is it easy? I, to me, I think it depends on, well, were they sorry? Did they come back and say they were sorry? Did, did, did they even think they were wrong? You got all these questions. But really, we are to have a forgiving spirit, a forgiving heart. Sometimes we need to pray about that. A pure heart. Back in, I think, again, of Psalms 51 and verse 10, where it says, Creating me a clean heart or a pure heart, O God. We need to pray for a pure heart. For our affections and desires are directed toward God instead of towards things of this world. For wisdom. Okay, we talked about that in James chapter 1. If you ask for any lack of wisdom, pray for it with faith. Spiritual well being of our brethren. Okay? Because what about, what is the spiritual health of people in the church? Well, it's from over here to over here. It's just in anyone you go to. It's, it's a spectrum. Pray for the spiritual well-being. What does it say in uh, Ephesians 6, 18? Be on the alert. Pray for all the saints, all the brethren. Pray for the lost. Do we have a heart for the lost? We should. One thing that attracted my wife and I to this congregation is there is a lot of effort here Towards evangelism. There's a focus here towards evangelism. Pray for opportunities to serve God. Do we do that? Bring an opportunity. And then for God to be with us, his hand to be with us when, when that opportunity comes to do whatever it is he has for us to do. This is not an exhaustive list, but things to be praying about that are spiritual in nature. So remember that we're to pray at all times. Pray in the Spirit, be on the alert for all the saints. Okay, in the next two verses, which we've already read, is what Paul is in prison. And you might think, Paul says, he specifically asked for the, the brethren to pray for him. And you might think he would, 
ask them to pray that he'll get out of prison. He'll get out of these chains. He doesn't ask for that. Okay? He asked the brother to pray for him. He asked that he'll be able to do the very thing that got him in trouble to start with. Speak boldly the word of God. Interesting. Interesting. Paul didn't make excuses. I can, uh, to me, Paul would have been a perfect, perfect place, be normal to make an excuse. Help me to get out of these chains so that I can further the word of God. Because woe is me. He didn't do that. So do we make excuses? Boy, when I get past fill in the blank, when I get to feeling better physically, when my job gets into a better place, when I, what's well, something else, y'all tell me. I'm going to stand here until somebody tells me something. When I have time, oh, oh, wow. Okay, matter of priorities maybe, huh? Do we make excuses? Well, there's no excuses. Paul served where he was. In fact, if you read in the book of Philippians, his circumstances worked out for the greater good of the gospel. It, it motivated the church. And at the end of Philippians, we read, um, the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Wow. He evangelized Caesar's household. He didn't make excuses. He just did it right there. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, I said we'd come back there, so here we are. Um, it's very similar. Starts out, be devoted to prayer. Keep alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. And Paul says, pray for us. Okay? That we may make basically the same thing. Bold in the way we ought to speak. Then in verses 5 and 6, this is not in Ephesians, this is in Col Colossians though. He flips it on the church. Okay? So we, who, who is to be evangelistic? I mean, preacher? Preacher, preacher? okay. Okay, elders? Elders? Deacons? Teachers? Okay, how about all of us? Because in, in Colossians, it's written to the church, in Colossi, verse 5 says, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders. What's outsiders? Those, those outside the church, those outside Christ, non-Christians. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Wow. Everyone needs help. Yeah, okay. Particularly those who are outside of Christ. And then verse 6 is, let your speech be with grace. Is our speech always with grace, seasoned as it were with salt? Or do we go up and start beating them over the head with the Bible? Okay. <laughs> I don't think it means you're supposed to be salty, Chris. <laughs> Okay. Philip hooked up with the unit. Okay. The Spirit spoke to Philip and said, I want you to go. Okay. He went. All right. I believe this is the last slide. Prayer must be integrated into the Christian's daily walk. We have to have an attitude and disposition toward prayer all the time. Pray in faith. Pray in the Spirit. Because prayer is a privilege, it's a commandment, it's powerful. Being constant in prayer, in tune with and focused on the Lord, marshal spiritual forces of God on our behalf, makes us ready for battle. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us, for blessing us. Father, thank you for the armor that you've given us, that we may be strong in you and the strength of your might. Father, help us to be constant in prayer, devoted to prayer, thankful in prayer. Father, may we pray in a way that pleases you. May we pray for the things that you would have us to pray for. May we have faith. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we've got the month of November to finish up this class. So that's four more lessons. So next week we're going to Romans chapter 1. We're going to start talking about spiritual strongholds, things we suffer with. At the end of 
about the last half of Romans 1.